Hi everyone, um, I'm back with another video. This one is actually talking about DNA. And we're going to talk basic principles or essentials about DNA replication. So let's get started. Okay, so before I actually get into the information, I just want to mention something about DNA. DNA encodes for everything regarding you. If we're talking about a bacteria, it encodes everything regarding the bacteria. So anything that is made up, every protein, even the membranes, anything that's made you know, in your body is encoded by genes and genes are found on your DNA. So it's important for your cells to actually replicate or make copies of your DNA. And so this process of replication is very important. So let's get started talking about DNA replication. Okay, so there were several theories circulating on how DNA replicates or how they make a copy of themselves. First, I'm going to start with the ones that do not make any sense that we know now. So there was the conservative style of replication that basically said that you have, after a round of replication, you'll have one whole DNA that's all old, and then you'll have one that's just brand new. That's known as conservative style replication. Then we have the dispersive style that they're talking about where different parts of the DNA can be found um, in the growing strands. But what we actually do know is that DNA replicates in us and other biological or living beings in the form of a semi-conservative replication. What that actually means is that during replication, you know, because DNA is double-stranded, I will talk about that. One strand will serve as the template that's known as the parent strand. And then you'll have the growing strand, which will be the complement to it, and that will be brand new. So semi-conservative means half old or half parent and then half new. Okay, so studies, research has shown now that it is semi-conservative style of replication. Okay, so in eukaryotes like you and I, or plants, the DNA is actually linear. Okay, so linear meaning like, you know, how chromosomes look like this, right? It's actually linear. And bacteria, is, on the other hand, is not linear. Bacterial DNA is circular. So we see that here. Now, there's one chromosome in bacteria, whereas eukaryotes tend to have multiple, like you and I, we have 46, whereas bacteria has one. Now, how bacteria replicate and how eukaryotes replicate, there may be some differences in the machinery that does it, but the process is very similar. To start out, remember, we have linear DNA. All right, so the point where replication starts is called origin of replication. All right, so back in um, eukaryotes, we have multiple origins of replication, right? Whereas bacteria, since it's circular, only has one origin of replication. So we see that origin of replication right here, okay? Now that's where replication starts. Now, when re replication proceeds in the bacteria, it will go bi-directionally. So as you can see here, it's happening bi-directionally until it gets to an end point called a terminus, which we see here. All right, at that point, that's when it stops. And it kind of looks like this when it's done. You know, it's at that terminating sequence. And it can actually... Um, be clipped at that point. So I just wanted to let you know that the origin of replication is where starts the replication process. Remember I said eukaryotes has multiple origins of replication, but bacteria has one. All right, so let's take a little closer look at DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. So I know you learned that in school when you were younger. The sugar that makes it up is called deoxyribose, okay? So here we have our deoxyribose sugar, okay? That's what makes up the backbone right here of the DNA. DNA is double-stranded. So we see there's one strand and here's another strand. 
And in addition to that sugar, the deoxyribose, we have nucleotides or nitrogenous bases. All right, so we have our adenine, we have our thymine, and we have our guanine and cytosine. So we traditionally know these as A, T, G, and C, okay? In an ideal world where there is no mutation, A traditionally pairs with T and G pairs with C. So you can see here adenine's already paired up with thymine. This is adenine, here's thymine. Now DNA bases can either be purines, purine or pyrimidine, okay? That's a long word right there. All right, so purines include adenine and guanine, okay? So the adenine, so let me put this in a different color, adenine and guanine are the purines, right? That means the thymine and the cytosine, thymine and cytosine are the pyrimidines. Remember, A pairs with T and G pairs with C. Now, another thing I want to show you, let me erase this so you can see it a little bit better, right? Are the bonds found between the base pairs. All right, if we take a look at the adenine and thymine, we see that there is one and two hydrogen bonds between the adenine and thymine. When we take a look at the guanine, we have one, two, and three. So the um, GCs have three bonds in between and the A and T has two bonds, okay? So this is DNA. Another thing I wanna mention is the orientation. You will have the strands, remember it's double-stranded, they will be anti-parallel. What does that mean? That means you'll have one end starting with three prime and ending in five prime, and one starting with five prime, ending in three prime. So they're almost opposite of each other. Now I wanna to mention to you that the three prime end has a hydroxyl group sticking out. That is actually very important in the aiding of making that phosphodiester bond that we find in the backbone of DNA. All right, so on the five prime end, we have a phosphate group that's sticking out. So when we hear three to five prime, we're talking about um, the location of the sugar and what's sticking out. So on the three prime end, that's the third carbon of the deoxyribose. And on the three prime end, we have that hydroxyl group sticking out. Okay, whereas on the five prime ends, it's on the fifth carbon of the sugar and we have our phosphate group that is present. Okay, so that's a little something about um, the DNA. All right, just to look at a better um, structural look at the DNA. Remember, DNA is composed of a nitrogenous base, so it could be A, T, G, or C. We have our sugar, right? In, in DNA, it's deoxyribose, okay? And then we have our phosphate group, which is present. All right, so basically they will come together to make DNA. All right, so to further expand, this is another good thing to show you. This shows you the sugar phosphate backbone. Here's a deoxyribose, and here's the phosphates that's present. Remember the phosphates found on that five prime end? and we have the hydroxyl group on that three prime end. And then here we have our nitrogenous bases, right? And here we have the bonds in between. You remember A and T has two and G and C has three. Now, another thing I wanna mention over here is that DNA, not only is it double-stranded, but it's also found as a helix. You see how it's kind of like coiling around? Right, so it is a helix and it has major grooves, this is a minor groove here, and then it has major grooves here. Okay, so this is the major groove, that's the minor groove. So when it's turning, that's the way we see it. Okay, so this is a simplified version of replication. And I'm showing you this picture because I want to introduce you to the key players that play a role in replication. So the first thing I wanna talk about is our original DNA template. That is the parent strand of the DNA. Because you remember, here's the DNA, 
and it has to be opened up in order for this to happen. So we have our DNA template. The next thing I want to note is a very, very important key player. One of the major key players is DNA polymerase. All right, so based on if you're eukaryotic versus prokaryotic, there are different types. Like I know for bacteria, DNA polymerase 3 tends to play the more critical role in replication. So what DNA polymerase does is actually add another key player, which are the nucleotides. So the nucleotides are known as DNTPs, which stands for deoxynucleotide triphosphates. So it will look at the parent strand and based on whatever base is here, let's say that blue one, they said is guanine. Okay, so this one right here. So if that's guanine, that means it's going to recruit the complement, which should be cytosine, which is the green here, which is actually showing you that. Okay, so it serves as the template. Another key player I do want to mention is this helicase. Okay. Helicase is really important because it has to be able to unwind and unzip the DNA in order for it to get replicated because if it's closed, it cannot do anything. Okay, So those are some of the major key players. Of course, this is a simplified version. Now, I do want to mention something else to you is that there's two different strands that we see in replication. So the top strand is known as the leading strand and the bottom strand is known as the lagging strand. And because of how the orientation of a synthesis is or the orientation of the parent strand is what actually drives some of the things that we see in the lagging strand that's not in the leading strand. So we'll go ahead and get started and talk about that. All right, so this diagram right here, it looks like a lot of stuff going on. So let me just explain. This is DNA in DNA replication in bacteria. All right, because you remember I said that in bacteria we have that DNA polymerase 3. All right, there it is. All right, so first thing I want to say is that the leading strand, when it gets synthesized, it's synthesized continuously. And the reason why we see that is because the parent strand is 3 to 5 prime. And the synthesis will occur in five to three prime, right? So you remember that three prime end has that hydroxyl group that's needed for the DNA polymerase to help make that phosphodiester bond in the backbone. All right, so if we take a look here, um, we will, this is not showing you one, but there typically is a primer that will start off the process and you will have your DNA polymerase that will slide along the leading strand and adding the proper bases. And remember, there is a helicase that will be ahead of it that will unzip it. And you'll also have proteins that will kind of stabilize the DNA before it can close back on itself. So this is one continuous, but I want to, you to look at this lagging strand. All right, the lagging strand has something called Okazaki fragments. Okazaki fragments are made because there is an issue in the parent strand direction, all right? The parent strand is going from five to three. That means if it was to synthesize, it would be synthesizing kind of weird. Okay, so here's the problem. Ideally, DNA needs the parent strand to be in that three prime to five prime direction, okay? Because if the parent is three to five, then it will be synthesizing its new strand um, five prime to three prime. Okay, so you remember that three prime end had that hydroxyl group that's sticking out. That hydroxyl group is really important for that DNA polymerase to work. Now, if you take a look at that leading strand, the leading strand is in that three prime to five prime. When we look at the parent strand, it's in the proper configuration. But remember, it's anti-parallel, so the lagging strand is not actually going to start out in the three prime direction. Is starting out in that five prime direction. So that causes a problem. It would not be a problem if the DNA was actually unwounded all the way before replication started, right? Because then that three prime end would be here and that three prime end would be here and it can go ahead and synthesize, you know, synthesize here's the leading strand in that direction and the lagging strand in this direction. But 
there is an issue because the DNA does not unzip completely before replication starts. It opens up, as you can see here, it starts replication as it opens. All right, so here is the, pro this is how the problem is actually solved. So let's talk about that. Okay, so let's talk about how this problem is actually solved. I'm going to erase some of this, okay, to make some room. All right, so in order to solve that problem, let me erase this as well. So you can get some room, you can see things a little bit clearer. Is that the cell will actually produce these little, or enzymes in the cell, will produce these little fragments called RNA primers. Okay, RNA primer is made by RNA primase um, that will make these short primers. And what's actually at the end of the primers are three prime hydroxyls, okay? So we have those hydroxyl groups that are essentially available based on those primers. Now, those primers that we see here are substitutes. They're not going to stay there. So we see that they will be found over various parts of the lagging strand. All right, in addition to that, polymerase will recognize that primer and will start adding the bases like how we would see in the leading strands. But because we have so many of them found in the lagging strand, each of those primers with bases will come together as what's known as Okazaki fragments. So the Okazaki fragments, so I'll just put O for Okazaki fragments, are primers, all right? Remember these are RNA primers that are temporary substitutes plus Nucle so nucleotide bases, okay? Nucleotides. And they are fragments. They are short fragments. So let me clear this up so you can see what's actually going on here. So we have our primers, all right? Our DNA polymerase will recognize the primer end, the three prime end, and start adding bases. And it will stop when it gets close to another Okazaki fragment. So it will continue to do that. Now, once you have these Okazaki fragments, we can't leave them like that. So there will be an actual, of uh, another type of polymerase that will come in, kind of kick off those primers and fill it in with DNA. And so we won't have any RNA primers at that point. And DNA ligase will come in and seal those backbone ends by making the bonds. And we see the DNA ligase working here. So this is showing you DNA polymerase 1 that's kind of coming in and filling in that gap, whereas DNA polymerase 3 is the main one. So just to take note, the leading strand is continuous because the parent strand is 3 to 5, and it will have no issues making 5 to 3. Maybe just need one primer to start off, if that. But when we look at the lagging strand, it is the parent strand is the opposite. And so since you cannot wait to unzip the whole DNA, the problem is solved by RNA primers being made by RNA primase, and it'll be found all throughout. Polymerase will recognize it, synthesize the different fragments called Okazaki fragments, and then after we have all these fragments, DNA polymerase 1 will come in and kind of replace that RNA primer with the proper DNA, and then DNA ligase will come in and seal up the rest. So if you take a look at it, the leading strand looks pretty smooth, whereas the lagging strand looks like it's having a pretty hard time. But it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, they all work. Now, just to mention here, in bacteria, there are um, particular types of toporisomerases that are present. And remember I said bacterial DNA is circular, and it's not found l looking like a circle in a cell. It's pretty much coiled. Um, we call that supercoiling. So the toporisomerases kind of play a role in unwinding or winding up the DNA depending on what type of topoisomerase is present. Okay, so I just want to mention to you, there are a lot of bases that DNA polymerase has to add in a short period of time. 
thing that happens is that there can be accidents where bases, the wrong base can accidentally be added. If that happens, it may be picked up and it may be corrected. And how that happens is that DNA polymerase actually has a proofreading function. So as the DNA is added, there's a portion of DNA polymerase that will double check and make sure it's correct. If it's not correct, it can remove the wrong base and place it with the right one. I actually like that because if that didn't happen, there would be so many more issues going on, a lot more tumors and cancers and things that are arising. So DNA polymerase does have a proofreading function. There's one part of it that plays a role in that growing strand. There's a proofreading part portion to it. And there's a primer removal portion, or if it needs to correct a problem, it can do so. Okay, so it's quiz time. Let's see what you have retained from this lecture. All right, what does DNA stand for? All right, I'm, I'm making this format a little bit different. It's not multiple choice. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, so hopefully you got that. What style of replication does DNA undergo? Because you remember there was um, conservative, semi-conservative, and dispersed. So which one do you think it could be? If you said semi-conservative, you are correct. What enzymes play a role in making the new DNA strand? Right? What, which enzyme or what enzymes play a role? So there was one key player that I discussed that helped to add the nucleotide bases. If you said DNA polymerase, you are correct. All right, what is the direction of the growing strand in the leading strand of DNA? All right, so I'm talking about what is the direction. Is it 5 to 3 or is it 3 to, three to 5 in the leading strand of DNA? Well, if you said the growing strand is 5 to 3, you are correct. Because you remember the parent strand is opposite, okay, which is 3 to 5. In DNA, adenine pairs with which base does adenine pair with in an ideal world without mutations? If you said thymine, you are correct. The site where replication starts is called what? Okay, you remember there's one in bacteria and there's multiple in eukaryotes. If you said origin of replication, you are right. Which base pairs have three hydrogen bonds found inside? Right, so is it AT or GC? Which one has three hydrogen bonds? If you said guanine and cytosine, you are correct. Okay, so where are Okazaki fragments found? Okay, so hopefully, you remember there's two strands, leading and lagging strand. Hopefully you remember that it is the lagging strand because you remember what makes up Okazaki fragments are the primers and the small pieces of bases that were added after that. You remember the primers add as act as a substitute. All right, so hopefully you got 100 on the quiz. Please let me know how you did or just give me a comment on what you learned. I would love to hear from you. So until the next video, bye.